Today we have Dr. David Perlmutter with us. I'm sure many of you know who he is. He is the author of Grain Brain, which I know has really uh, catapulted him into mainstream, which is awesome. And also the author of the Grain Brain Cookbook. And we're really trying to tie together the notion that the gut and the brain uh, communicate with each other. Who knew? I thought you, I, I think I heard you actually on, on another interview when somebody said, we all know, you know, we refer to the gut as the second brain and you said it actually may be the first brain. Might well be. I mean, when you think of what's going on in the gut in terms of its genetic potential, in terms of what the gut bacteria uh, can do in terms of human metabolism, obesity, inflammation, autoimmunity, that's where it starts. You know, those are the key players in brain degenerative conditions like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's and even things like autism and to some degree even ADHD, so prevalent in Western cultures. And we're now really getting a handle on the notion that the gut has a huge influence on what goes on in the brain. And I'm sure that you and I will talk about that. Well, let's first just get into kind of what is brain inflammation? Well, it's nothing different than anything uh, that anyone else is familiar with. It's the same process of creating uh, life-sustaining inflammatory chemicals. You know, there's a good side to inflammation. It helps us deal with infection, helps us uh, immobilize and a damaged part. Uh, but the downside is when it's chronic, it increases free radicals, it damages our DNA, our fat, our protein, and leads to tissue destruction. It's why the arthritic uh, joint becomes uh, destroyed, the uh, inflamed uh, coronary arteries become narrowed. And it's the same process that underlies why a person's brain will shrink when he or she is becoming demented. So. In the brain, we don't really appreciate inflammation as readily because when your brain is inflamed, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't become red, it doesn't get swollen. We don't really get the opportunity to appreciate uh, the, the simple fact that inflammation underlies things like Alzheimer's, now affecting uh, 5.4 million Americans, an inflammatory disorder, really, for the most part, not a genetic disorder, mm -hmm. not a genetic inheritance issue, but perhaps some genetic predisposition, but more importantly, absolutely and fundamentally related to our lifestyle choices that increase inflammation. And these are centered upon, for example, the very foods that we eat leading to inflammation throughout the body and clearly being related to developing an incurable disease, at least as you and I have this conversation, uh, called Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. related to the foods that we eat. That's an important uh, conversation to have. And, and what really is that role? So inflammation is, you're saying, is leading to these diseases, but how is it really doing that? Well, I guess what you're asking is mechanistically. And you know, until recently, I think a lot of interest has been focused on what is called glycation of proteins, mm -hmm. meaning that the higher your blood sugar is, the more your blood sugar will bind to proteins in a process called glycation. Uh, we measure that, for example, with the plain old-fashioned A1C test that diabetics use to measure their average blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that as a metric, A1C, an average uh, a measurement of your average blood sugar, which is a glycated protein, in this case, globin, powerfully relates to the rate at which your brain shrinks. Higher A1C, even well below the levels that are qualified for diagnosing diabetes, directly correlate with the rate at which your brain shrinks. So that's something you don't want to have. No. That said, the mechanism is that when proteins become glycated, it turns on genetic pathways that amp up uh, the production of these inflammatory chemicals called cytokines. Mm -hmm. Now beyond that, a newer mechanism that is becoming really uh, quite exciting for those of us who are looking beyond the brain has to do with the role of these glycated proteins, again, brought on by having higher blood sugar, in terms of their increased permeability uh, events in terms of the gut. In other words, glycated proteins, these things called AGEs, advanced glycosylated end products, or AGEs, protein bound to sugar, increases the leakiness of the gut. Hmm. When the gut is leaky, uh, that is uh, just like turning on gasoline to the flames of inflammation. When the gut becomes leaky, to be technical about it, what happens is uh, there is a coating over what are called gram-negative bacteria, which are hugely represented in the gut. Mm 
When that coding that goes by the initials LPS makes its way into the systemic circulation, it just causes inflammation to go haywire. Elevated levels of this LPS, which correlate to dramatic increased uh, inflammation, are strongly correlated with Alzheimer's, uh, even uh, Lou Gehrig's disease for that matter. Hmm. Depression, for example, is now looked upon as a smoldering inflammatory event in the human brain brought on by leakiness of the gut. So how incredible it is, Dr. Myers, that you and I are having a conversation about things that go on in the brain, and we are exploring the health of the gut as it relates to the brain. So uh, we've got to really start to pay strict attention if we're going to have leverage points in neurological conditions like ADHD and autism, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and Alzheimer's. We've got to pay attention to what is going on in the gut. And that means we've got to pay attention to the overusage of antibiotics that damage the gut bacteria, the explosive overusage of antibiotics uh, in cattle that are then consumed by us. That's where 70 to 80 percent mm -hmm. of the antibiotics in America are used. We've got to understand that the very medications we are using to treat inflammation are damaging the gut lining. And we've even got to take this back to how you were born. The method of delivery is how we inoculate the gut bacteria from the get-go. Mm -hmm. That when that child passes through the birth canal, through mother's birth canal, the bacteria are invested into the mouth uh, to begin populating the gut. And that sets the stage for inflammation for that child for the rest of his or her mm -hmm. lifetime. That either sets the stage for an autoimmune condition like type 1 diabetes or celiac disease, or it sets the stage for that immune system to be perfectly balanced and adaptable and able to confront uh, changes in the environment as that individual grows up. Autoimmunity is a delicate balance between a malfunctioning immune system that's either too active or one that is uh, underactive, mm -hmm. in which case we're susceptible to all kinds of infection. Overactivity of the immune system to the extent that the body fails to differentiate between self and non-self, comma, the cornerstone of, uh, of autoimmunity, uh, is really um, set by what goes on the gut bacteria. So these factors of early life exposure to antibiotics for every sniffle or sore ear that a child might have, the continued push for women to use formula when they're given samples uh, in the, right when they get out of the delivery room before they leave the hospital. Uh, the continued over usage of, of antibiotics in, in the production of food, uh, of meat, and even as mentioned, the, um, this uh, over usage of cesarean sections is setting up a generation of newborns for conditions that are life-threatening and in my business, for conditions that threaten brain health and is preventable uh, by getting this information uh, to the population at, uh, in general. But interestingly enough, we know now that in autism, there's an overgrowth in the gut of clostridial species that make a certain short-chain fatty acid called propionate that has some very powerful relationships to autism. Mm -hmm. In one study by a Dr. Feinfold, uh, he actually treated autistic kids by giving them vancomycin, the very drug used to treat C. diff, mm -hmm. and had a dramatic and almost instantaneous improvement uh, in their autistic issues. So again, uh, we are visiting this notion that when you change what's going on in terms of gut bacteria, there can be some very, very powerful events that occur with reference to the brain, uh, in this case for a disease for which we have no answers right now, and that is autism, affecting perhaps one in 53 male births in America today, clearly related uh, to those countries that have a westernized diet, a westernized approach to hygiene, to having hand sanitizers at the end cap in every aisle in the grocery store, mm -hmm. we don't see autism in countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where the gut bacteria have great diversity. Mm -hmm. The gut might carry parasites. This establishes a healthy uh, microbiome. And interestingly enough, a study just came out from Britain demonstrating 
a direct relationship between the degree of sterility of the gut, the absence of diversity and the absence of parasites, and the development of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Those countries where they're dirty, where the kids play in the dirt, where they have pets and other animals, and they don't get an antibiotic every time they have a sniffle, those countries have dramatic reduction in terms of risk for Alzheimer's disease. So we're actually learning a lot in yeah. terms of the effects of what we eat and our hygiene uh, in terms of risk for devastating neurologic conditions. Well, let's talk about food and its effect both on the microbiome as well as inflammation. I think that the, the biggest factor these days is the effects of a high carbohydrate diet and high simple sugar diet uh, in terms of modifying the gut microbiome, the bacteria, including their genes, that's the term microbiome, uh, and to a secondary degree of fat. I think that what we're now seeing is that fat uh, is an issue in the diet when it's accompanied by a high carbohydrate load. In other words, the standard Western diet or standard American diet, high in fat, and especially damaging fats, damaged fats, omega-6 pro-inflammatory fats, modified fats, trans fats, etc., in the environment of high carbs, that ingress of fat through a damaged gut lining, the way is paved by high carbs, uh, is really setting the stage for some bad things to happen. These high energy uh, diets are associated with changes in the ratios of the major classes of bacteria actually at what's called a phylum level. That's high up on the scale, that balance of things like firmicutes and bacterioides, the two major classes of bacteria in the gut, those balances are altered based upon diet, based upon being breastfed, based upon being born vaginally or through cesarean section. Um, so that higher levels of these firmicutes bacteria uh, are associated with obesity, are associated with breakdown of the uh, blood, of the gut lining, and I almost said blood-brain barrier, and I can say right. that because at the end of the day, it suffers as well. That we now understand that factors that increase permeability of the gut lining, like, for example, exposure to the protein gliadin, which is found in foods that contain gluten, uh, that exposure to gliadin, uh, increases permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So, yeah, it's not a good thing to have a leaky gut, but I can promise you having a leaky brain is not a picnic either. <laughs> no. So, um, you know, when you, when you read the work of uh, researchers like Dr. Alessio Fasana, now at Harvard, who indicates that, you know, this notion that some people are gluten-sensitive, he finds that the mechanism of gliadin, a protein found in gluten, in terms of the gut permeability through a mediator protein called zonulin, is present in 100% of humans to some degree. So why did I focus on uh, gluten in, in terms of your brain's silent killers in the book Brain Brain? I focused on it because it leads to increased gut permeability, and that's what you and I have been talking about since we started today, and that is that this gut permeability is the cornerstone of just about everything bad you don't want to get. Yes. Inflammation mediates your risk for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, lupus, any, anything that you can think of that you don't want to get, aside from trauma perhaps, is basically an inflammatory condition. When we experience stress, mechanisms in the brain, uh, for your technical people, that would be the HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, Basically, the brain sends out signals to the adrenal glands to make cortisol. And what does cortisol do when we're under stress? That's our fight or flight hormone, helps us uh, get away from the lion that's chasing us. But chronic stress, chronic elevation of cortisol leads to, you guessed it, increased gut permeability, mm -hmm. increasing the stage, uh, well, setting the stage for inflammation, feeding back to the brain. Uh, inflammatory cytokines, those mediators of inflammation that are produced at the gut level and throughout the body when the gut is leaky, actually then feed back to the brain and lead to damage uh, to various parts of the brain, including the memory center. That activates 
the HPA axis, sending further cortisol uh, to the gut, which then further leads to gut leakiness. So, uh, in addition, leads to changes in the array of gut bacteria. That's what cortisol does. And in, in and of itself, uh, stimulates regulatory T cells to actually increase inflammation further. These bacteria are manufacturing our neurotransmitters. They're manufacturing the chemicals that mm -hmm. mediate how we experience the world. Uh, a recent study published also in the journal, I believe, Gastroenterology, uh, researchers out in California took a group of women, 36 women, and divided them in, into three groups. One group got a milk product, the next group got a fermented milk product, and the third got basically a placebo. And at the beginning of the study, they measured what's called functional MRI of their brain activity. And then after a period of time, they repeated the study, and they challenged these groups of women, each individual, with a quasi- threatening picture of, of a face of somebody that was a bit threatening or, or worrisome. The reactions on the functional MRI were dramatically different based upon whether they got the fermented product or not. Wow. That those individuals who had been consuming a product rich with probiotics had a damped, uh, a reduction in the way that the images appeared threatening. Well, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is a topic of another discussion, right. but the point is that the bacteria contained in this food changed the way those individuals responded to or experienced the world. Amazing. That their impression of what was going on in their environment was altered by the very bacteria contained in their gut based upon the foods that they ate. So it really tends to open the door to consideration of what happens in the future for treatment of things like depression and anxiety and schizophrenia, uh, which we know is strongly associated with changes uh, at the gut level in terms of the microbiome.